I've heard of cases where uh, women have been attacked by workers um, as recently as last month, and it's disturbing. Tonight, a culture of racism comes to light in yet another report on hydro development in northern Manitoba. I see Indigenous women um, displaying incredible amounts of strength and courage and uh, I just wanted to highlight that. A project aimed at changing the way Canadians treat Indigenous women, two-spirited and transgender people. And defeating the stereotypes by going beyond Hollywood. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. And I'm Melissa Ridgen. In British Columbia, deaths that are deemed not suspicious are handled by BC coroners. Brittany Martel's death was deemed not suspicious. Her body was found in a ditch near Merritt, BC on July 23rd. But for the Martel family, not suspicious means a lot of waiting for answers. Our reporter Charlotte Morton Jacobs first reported on the story in July. Here she is with an update. That's weird. It's clues like this Dolly Martel clings to. I've watched it over and over again. I've paused it so many times looking for something, anything that could tell me. Like I've Googled um, how far the distance from where that, that was to where she was found. This dash cam footage is of Dolly's niece, Brittany Martell. It shows Brittany on the highway where she died, alive. The guy in the, the video that took the dash cam, uh, him and his wife were um, thought it was strange that she was um, it looked like she was waiting for somebody, like she was, she was, because she was walking backwards on a, in a one-way traffic lane, and it was just kind of strange to them. There, it, it just looked like she was waiting for somebody. The family has also received photos like this from individuals who attended a candlelight vigil for Brittany near where she was found, immediately after the RCMP had searched the area and deemed the case not suspicious. Brittany's personal belongings were also found by the public a few kilometers from where she was discovered after the police say they had searched the area. We have built a timeline for where we believe Brittany was and coming from and going to and that kind of thing. So we have, na we have nailed down very what we think very accurately how she came to be up there, but um, just don't know what caused her death. So we're, we're no more closer in that regard than we were last time we spoke makes me really angry like you know the the longer that this is prolonged it just feels like Brittany's just case is just going to be swept under the rug. BC coroners are waiting on toxicology results not expected till October. The family says they wish the RCMP would interview more people Brittany hitchhiked with like her boyfriend. Like he was physically taken off the bus by the bus driver because um, he was getting violent with Brittany on the bus. As the investigation continues, the family mourns their loss. My baby would have been born like four days before her birthday. That's my due date. Her birthday is September 16th. Yeah. And I'm due the 12th. So. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, ABC National News, Caladeche, First Nation. Another report has come to light detailing a, quote, culture of discrimination and harassment at a Manitoba Hydro mega project. This one was completed just last year. It comes just one week after a scathing report with allegations of decades of racism and sexual abuse at past projects near northern First Nations. Hydro development in Manitoba has been a contentious issue between Indigenous peoples and the province for decades. But disturbing allegations of physical and sexual abuse and the level of racism are just now coming to light in newly released reports. Recent testimony involved projects dating back as far as the 1960s. Now, an independent report is coming to light that found a culture of discrimination and harassment at a project currently under construction. A former Grand Chief for First Nations in Northern Manitoba says it's still ongoing. Yes, I've heard of cases where uh, women have been attacked by workers um, as recently as last month, and 
It's disturbing. It's disturbing to know that uh, these kind of attitudes still are, are affecting our people in a very negative way and putting people's lives in danger. The Kiask Generation Project is a multi-billion dollar development being undertaken in a partnership by Manitoba Hydro and four First Nations. People who took part in a culture assessment review in 2017 spoke of their fear of retaliation for raising their concerns. But among those raised included living in jail-like conditions, with some referring to the camp as Kiaskatrez. Others are quoted as saying there's too much discrimination towards Indigenous workers. An employee who said they were called seal eater, squaw and Pocahontas. Concerns are also raised about drugs and alcohol at the site. Manitoba Hydro says as of August 2018, 63 of the 64 recommendations in the report have been completed. The province called in the RCMP to look at earlier allegations. North wants to see an outside organization involved. Absolutely. I think that every time that there's RCMP involvement in anything, uh, there has to be an independent body that comes in and and monitors the investigation and does the investigation. I don't think it's fair to anyone, not even to the RCMP. A spokesperson for Manitoba's Independent Investigation Unit says a decision on whether it will launch its own probe into the earlier disturbing allegations of abuse is expected this week. A committee has also been set up by the province. North would like to see a process for victims to have their voices heard in a way that makes them feel safe and secure. A 16-year-old has been charged in a highway shooting that occurred earlier this month and left a German tourist with a serious brain injury. The teen, who is from the Stony Nakota First Nation and can't be named because of his age, is facing 14 charges, including attempted murder. APTN's Tamara Pemmental is at the Stony Nakota First Nation and joins us now. Hey Tamara, so what are you hearing from the people in the community about these charges? So the Stony Nakota officials say they don't have enough information to comment just yet, but they did put out a uh, statement saying that the community is feeling sadness and remorse, and this event has cast a dark shadow on the First Nation. They also say they offer thoughts and prayers to everyone involved, including the RCMP, as the investigation continues. And do we know what the condition is of the German tourist who was shot? So the tourist is back in Ger Germany and the German consulate says that he can't speak or move his right side due to his injuries and that he has a long road to gain recovery. What, do, what have we heard? Do we know? I mean, we can't identify the person who's charged in this crime, of course, but do we know um, what po possible motive was? Are you hearing anything in the community? So we don't know much about the teen yet. All we do know is that he made his first appearance mm -hmm. in the Cochrane Provincial Court yesterday morning on Tuesday. And his lawyer had asked that the case be adjourned until September 4th. Uh, so that's all we have for right now. Well, thanks so much for bringing us this update, Tamara. Thank you. We want to hear what you think. Here's how to continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca, find us online at aptnnews.ca, and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow APTN News on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more Indigenous news. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has provided new mandate letters to some of his cabinet ministers. To explain what mandate letters are and if Indigenous people should take note is APTN's host of our political show, Nation to Nation, Todd Lamorant. Todd, good to see you again. Uh, can you explain for those who don't know, what are mandate letters? Well, simply put, they're letters from Prime Minister Trudeau on what his expectations are of each of his cabinet ministers and what their top priorities should be. In the past, mandate letters were secret, but the current government made them public shortly after being elected in 2015. Now new ones replace old ones if priorities change. There's a cabinet shuffle, or is when what happened to Indigenous Affairs when it was split into Indigenous Crown Relations and Indigenous Services. Two new, new mandate letters were needed. 
Today, there were 10 new mandate letters issued to 10 cabinet ministers. Now, nothing really was new in them, as they're nearly identical to the old ones, with a few tweaks and a new priority or two. Todd, do you see anything in there of interest to Indigenous people? Well, like I said earlier, the new letters aren't much different than the old ones. But uh, Northern Affairs, until very recently, was part of Carolyn Bennett's Crown Indigenous Relations file. Now Dominic LeBlanc has the file and must still work in collaboration or support Bennett on a number of initiatives. For example, such as the de-evolution in Nunavut, a new Arctic policy, and the continued work on implementing an Indigenous rights framework. Similarly, there is a slight change to the Minister of Infrastructure, Francois-Philippe Champagne, in his portfolio, he must now support Indigenous Services Minister Jane Philpott in improving housing conditions on First Nations instead of Carolyn Bennett. So Todd, any uh, real significant changes here? There were a couple significant changes to priorities. For example, the Minister of Natural Resources, Amarjeet Sohi, has a new priority spelled out for him. And that's to work with the Minister of Finance, Bill Morneau, and ensure the Trans Mountain Pipeline gets twinned. As well, the Minister of Canadian Heritage had a priority in the past to work with Indigenous Affairs to promote and preserve Indigenous languages. However, that has changed and Minister Pablo Rodriguez is now expected to bring forth an Indigenous Languages Act, preserve, protect and revitalize languages. That's something National Chief Perry Bellegarde wanted to make a priority when I spoke to him after his re-election last night. And there was another minor change to the mandate letter to the Minister of Department of Fisheries and Oceans to take into account indigenous knowledge when, along with scientific evidence when making decisions about fish stocks and ecosystem management. Now that phrase indigenous knowledge wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. So that's just some of the changes, Dennis. Todd, appreciate you bringing us up to speed on these new mandate letters. You're welcome. The University of Alberta has launched a new project for Indigenous women, youth, transgendered and two-spirited peoples. The Resilience Project wants to hear from these groups to find out what makes them resilient and to share their stories. Here's APTN's Chris Stewart. Dr. Tracy Baer is the director of the Indigenous Women's Resilience Project. She was asked by the university to do a project about reconciliation. For the past year, she and her team have been working on this project. The types of areas that I work in, uh, I see Indigenous women um, displaying incredible amounts of strength and courage and uh, I just wanted to highlight that. I want to explore that a little more. Um, media doesn't often cover Indigenous women in um, fair, equitable ways. The Indigenous Women's Resilience Project was created to hear stories good and bad from Indigenous women, youth, transgendered and two-spirited people. How they were resilient or resistant against forces against them. We see big movements like Idle No More and you know Sylvia McAdam, one of the co-founders, is absolutely one of those resistant people. So there's those big things. But what about those little everyday things that people do constantly? And so we really wanted to um, highlight some of those little things. Interested people can go to the university's website, indigenouswomensresilience.com, to tell their story, or attend a symposium September 6th to 7th at the university. Dr. Baer says that Indigenous people don't fit into the traditional white people normative. On our online survey, we are encouraging people um, to put down all the places in which they don't fit into that normative, right? And then talk about their specific experiences and knowledge um, that comes from those embodied experiences. The results of the project will be shared with Indigenous communities and governments. The project is also aiming to integrate and publish for the public old databases that are no longer accessible, such as information on murdered and missing Indigenous women. The project will be hosting community meetings and having workshops in the future. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Sixty communities in northern Manitoba aren't happy with how Ottawa is awarding a telecommunications contract. We'll have that story and more after the break, but first here's tomorrow's weather. Starting on the east coast, we have 24 in Cloud and St. John's, 23 in Sunshine and Charlottetown. In northern Quebec, we have 8 in Sunshine and Inukshak. Nain, uh, 13 and some sunny. 
Shibugamu 12 and rain. Saguenay 15 and rain. Montreal 30 and rain. Toronto 30 and rain, as well as London and Windsor and Sarnia 29 in Ottawa. Big Trout Lakes in at 13, 21 in Sun in Thunder Bay. Elliott Lake and Sudbury both 19 in Sunny. Churchill will be 13, God's Lake 17, as well as Norway House. 18 in Barron's River and Sunshine, 21 in Winnipeg, 29 in Brandon. At 22 in a mix of sun and cloud in Saskatoon, 23 in a mix of sun and cloud in Regina. 14 in Buffalo Narrows with some rain, Larange, 17 in some rain, Meadow Lake, 15, and a little bit of rain too. Welcome back. Negotiations over a massive high-speed internet contract for remote northern First Nations in Manitoba seem to have slowed to the speed of dial-up. In January, the federal government announced it would be investing $43 million through the Connect to Innovate program. Since then, talks between the groups involved with construction of the fiber optic line have stalled. Brittany Hobson brings us more. A group of First Nations in Manitoba are calling out the federal government over a project to close the connectivity gap in remote and rural communities in Manitoba. In January, the government said they would be working with several groups to complete the project. Now one group is saying communication has shut down. Unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond our controls, we could not come to an agreement and we left the bargaining table to stand for our rights to control and own this network that is going to change the lives of our people. Chief David Crate is a co-chair of Clear Sky Connections, an Indigenous-owned group originally involved in the project. He says things went sour after the non-Indigenous-owned group, RF Now, wanted to take control over the installation, leaving the 48 First Nations involved upset. We consider this a form of economic genocide. We have the plans we have the plan that is going to make it work, that we see positive economic effects in our communities. We want to reap all the benefits of majority infrastructure projects on our traditional lands. According to Crate, RF Now only has the support of one First Nation community and has done little to work with others. We've done a lot of engagement with the communities. We've done our duty to, to consult with the First Nations. Uh, they haven't. It's only just recently they've now tried to engage the communities. CAC Dene Chief Tony Powderhorn says lack of cooperation from the government in RF Now are putting communities at risk. If only both sides can meet and try to work out some sort of agreement, we can get this thing. Like this thing's supposed to be started a year ago and they're still going back and forth over and who should rent the line. Crate says it's just bad business on Ottawa's part. The federal government to go ahead and make a decision which basically leaves out the communities again from having any economic opportunities and benefits for their community. Uh, it's a clear indication that there will be ongoing uh, concerns with the federal government if that's how they're going to conduct business. It is expected the federal government and the province of Manitoba will award the joint contract worth $63 million to RF Now. Chief Crate and Clear Sky Connections have sent letters to the Prime Minister and Manitoba Premier Brian Pallister urging them to reconsider the decision. APTN questioned the federal government on its decision to award the contract to a non-Indigenous owned group, but we did not receive a response by airtime. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. We need to take another short break after the rest of Thursday's weather. When we come back, an art exhibit that exposes the myths and stereotypes created by Hollywood's American Indian. In northern Alberta, we've got 15 and some rain in the high level, 16 in Peace River and Fort McMurray, 19 in Edmonton, 20 in Calgary. To the west coast, we've got 17 and some sunshine in Tofino, Bella Cool is in it, cloudy in 20. Dees Lake, 13. Fort St. John, hot. Sunny, 26. Mayo is in at 14, as well as Whitehorse, with some cloud up there. Watson Lake has cloud in 15. To the Northwest Territory, 16 in Wrigley, 15 in Fort Simpson, 16 in Trout Lake. Lots of sunshine up and around that part. Inuvik is 10, with some, uh, some rain and some cloud. 14 in Colville Lake. 7 in sunshine in Cambridge Bay. 12 down in Arviat. 
The glue looks in at seven with some rain. Cape Doris at four. The Calloway at seven. Indians Beyond Hollywood is a new temporary exhibition displayed by the Abenakis Museum in Odenac, Quebec. It exposes the myths and stereotypes created by, the, by Hollywood around the image of the American Indian, but it also offers a better understanding of the contemporary realities for First Nations people. Danielle Rochette reports. La première fois que Disney mettait en vedette euh, que le premier rôle était offert à Matthew Obamsawin and his team took more than one year to set up this exhibition. Their inspiration came from the current controversy over cultural appropriation. Donc, ce concept-là euh, nous a inspiré à faire euh, une exposition sur l'Indien d'Hollywood, euh, qui justement a euh, 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 favorisé ou en fait. Euh, a vraiment eu une influence sur comment que l'image des Premières Nations dans, dans les médias puis dans la consommation de masse euh, avait été créée de toutes pièces. En fait, que c'était vraiment euh, de, une image formatée, stéréotypée. Three distinct sections are displayed. The first one explores the origin of the Hollywood Indian, how Westerns from the early 20th century use non-Indigenous actors to play Indians. Tel personnage qui était très célèbre à cette époque, ben finalement c'est un, un un Britannique ou un Italien euh, qui avait des traits euh, que Hollywood jugeait euh, autochtones. Donc, on découvre qu'il y a également des gens euh, des différentes communautés qui ont fait carrière, eux également, euh, dans, les, dans les films, euh, films d'Hollywood pour personnifier les, euh, les Indiens. The second zone displays hundreds of toys, books, as well as an astonishing variety of everyday objects making visitors wonder about the reasons behind the manufacturer's motivation to create them. Là, on vient voir comment que les, euh, la consommation de masse a vraiment euh, déployé justement cette image-là à toutes les sauces, à toutes les formes euh, de produits, que ce soit des équipes de sport qui se sont appropriées une image de, de guerrier coiffé de plumes ou que ce soit des poupées Barbie. Nothing symbolizes indigenous stereotypes more than Halloween costumes. On a également acheté des costumes d'Halloween pour... Euh, pour justement les, les biens de la, les bienfaits de la cause, étant donné que euh, le comité de jeunes de Ganawagé euh, ont initié il y a quelques années des, euh, des campagnes de sensibilisation par rapport à l'appropriation culturelle. The third zone is one of discovery about the First Nations of Québec. Au terme de la visite, euh, les gens sont invités à venir découvrir les différentes communautés autochtones avec cet interactif-là. Donc, euh, par exemple, si on clique sur la nation Cree, bien, on, les gens vont découvrir euh, dans quelle mesure ils peuvent aller rencontrer ces, ces peuples-là, euh, ces communautés. Indians Beyond Hollywood will be on display at the Abenaki Museum until December 2019, with hopes for an exhibition in America. Daniel Rochette, EPTN National News, Odanak, Québec. They do well as a traveling exhibit as well. Yes, looks like it could be packed up and shipped all over the place. That's your APTN news for this Wednesday. For more, including the latest on tomorrow's big decision on the Trans Mountain Pipeline, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night. And I'm Melissa Ridge, and we're going to leave you with this video shot by Alan Spence just outside of Churchill, Manitoba, earlier this week. Take care. It's getting close. Oh, it's in its reflection. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's looking at its reflection. Look at it. It's wow. its reflection. Oh, it's looking at its eyes. <gasps> it's freaked out by its own reflection. Did you see when it backed up the first time? Oh, I'm recording right now. That is so cute. <laughs>